Good afternoon and welcome to the Virginia Bar Association's Practice Management Advisor webinar. I'm Paul Fletcher, the Executive Director of the VBA, and it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff Schoenberger of Affinity, Affinity Consulting, our partner in putting on the VBA PMA program, who is going to talk about uh, artificial intelligence today. This is the second of our two webinars here in March um, about AI. Uh, last week, we talked about AI 101. A lot of people have used um, various AI programs such as ChatGPT to do legal research, to do legal drafting. Today's program is how you might be able to use artificial intelligence to manage your law practice. And so not only is this the PMA uh, practice management advisor, it's also the AI advisor today. So, Jeff, do you want to take it away and tell us how to do it? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Let me uh, go ahead and share my screen here. And I've got the chat window up. I understand uh, last week was kind of a hot bench for the uh, AI question. So if you have any questions as you're going along, please feel free to throw them in the chat and I'll address them as I see them. Uh, emails up on the slide, pretty easy now. Uh, Jeff at lawyers.com, a little bit easier than doing my last name at Affinity Consulting. Uh, but if you have the old email address, it absolutely still works. They both go to the same place. Uh, obviously, we want to talk a little, just a little bit about the great resources that are available on the BARS website. So if you haven't taken a look at those or if you haven't been in a while, uh, please uh, stop by. And if you have a bunch of questions that come out of our conversation today, uh, absolutely schedule a, a time and we can sit down and chat individually. When I think about what we can sort of accomplish with AI, either today or in the near future, who knows what it's gonna look like years from now. I think about some of the things that are, you know, what are the best uses of our time when we're thinking about how many things we have to do as uh, legal professionals. So I think about the first job I had, and this was uh, right out of college. It was before I went to law school or anything like that. Uh, I was a legislative assistant, so you know one of the uh, low-level people in our uh, our legislative branch of government, and we all had specific responsibilities. And sometimes, you know, you're more, uh, I'd say, precocious. You're likely to try to do everything that you can, versus you know making sure that your time is devoted to the things that you're supposed to do well. And one of the things that had never occurred to me because I'd never had the experience of having anyone who was, uh, you know, someone who was there as a, uh, as a, you know, receptionist or legal professional or assistant or that sort of thing was that when it, when I wanted to do something like make copies, you know, I would just go and do it. And that would detract from the things that I was actually hired to do that I was supposed to do. And there was somebody else whose responsibility that was. When we think about what we're spending our time on as legal professionals, we need to think about some of the things that we can offload in the case of AI to at least give us, and we'll show it live here in just a little bit, just at least give us the idea of a rough draft. So maybe you're not the best, um, you know, blog post writer, or you're not the best at, you know, writing engaging LinkedIn, or you're not the best at, you know, thinking through how you should, uh, you know, start a, start up a case like doing initial client interviews you know maybe you're best at researching and grabbing the, you know coming out with that perfect answer but some of the other things around you know building out the business side or writing up to make sure that everybody knows you know what the right policy is internally to do something maybe that's not your strong suit and so some of those areas are great places where ai can help we're not relying on it for legal research, we're just relying on it for some of the business uh, internal management of the firm. So let's dive in really briefly. Since we did uh, AI 101 last week, we're going to kind of fly through some of this. What is artificial intelligence? Uh, generally, it's a sort of a simulation of the way humans think or, or sort of our ability to approximate with a computer how humans associate and learn and produce a response to some sort of input. Key characteristics that you should see in so any sort of artificial intelligence, and we'll get into the sort of the gener generative AI, which is the G when you think about uh, chat GPT, uh, but really any AI worth its salt is gonna be able to demonstrate some level of learning, 
some level of reasoning so it can, you know, think, I'm going to put that in quotes, think through what it's got, reach a solution, sort of understand what it's being fed. So it's got some level of perception. If you have, you know, one of those self-driving cars, there's some level of perception there. It's, you know, taking inputs, it's figuring out where the other vehicles are on the road, how fast, you know, they're driving, that sort of thing. And language understanding. And I think, um, I'm not sure if they, if the folks last week talked about this, but there's a really interesting level of sort of thought and analysis that goes into just the prompts that you type into an artificial intelligence. I mean, think about the work that has to go into, you type into it, you know, give me a sample PTO policy for a law firm. It's got to be able to break down and understand what you're looking for in order to produce something that is a, a good result. And so there's a lot of language understanding, you know, phrasing, understanding, all sorts of stuff like that, that goes into these models that are on the input side that are very interesting apart from what it puts out for us to look at. In some ways, artificial intelligence on, on different levels has been old hat. Like we've seen it, we've literally experienced it. If you have Netflix and it says, here are some suggested programs based on what you've watched in the past. That's a computer going through, looking at your viewing history, looking at how in a database, other shows, other movies are cataloged, what actors are in it, what actresses, maybe runtime, genre, that sort of thing. And saying, based on the input of your viewing, here are things that are similar that you might like. It's a form of artificial intelligence. Similarly, with either Siri or Alexa, they are uh, artificial intelligence, maybe depending on your experience, emphasis on the artificial. And every time I think about AI, and, I, and I'm excited by it, and I'll show you some really cool stuff that it can do. But at the same time, when I think about AI, I also think about these assistants. And Siri came, was first on the iPhone as a, like a built-in, like what we think of as Siri in 2011. And if you had asked me in say 2013, what will these virtual assistants be useful for? How will we be using them in 2024? So 11 years later, my answer would not have been what I use a virtual assistant for, which is essentially setting kitchen timers, figuring out the scores of ball games, or whether say Wilford Brimley is still alive. But unless your experience is dramatically different than mine, that's kind of where that virtual assistant, that artificial intelligence has sort of, at least for a while, stopped developing. Navigation, also another form of artificial intelligence. You tell it, your input is, here's where I am, here's where I wanna be, and this is the mode of transportation I wanna use. And it sits down and figures out based on what it knows and then within the confines of rules, are there one-way streets? Are there highways? Are there no sidewalks? Are there bike paths? Whatever you might need, it figures out how you're gonna get from point A to point B. Uh, again, form of intelligence, but we don't, we're not, we don't really think of it that way and we're not super excited about it in the way that we are with some of these generative AIs. And we'll get to those in just a second. Last example of artificial intelligence that we use almost every day, I would assume, any of these biometric tools that we use to get into our devices. So fingerprints, face scans, these are a form of artificial intelligence. The input being either your thumbprint that it has scanned and learned from different angles as you like move it around so that it knows to, you know, if you're approaching it from the left or the right, your thumb's a little twisted or whatever. Same thing with face, you know, do you, did you have a beard some days? Did you not? It's learning to figure out, is this the person I should let into the device? So it's the generative part of AI that is really new and exciting and sort of the kind of the game changer that we're seeing. And the reason this is particularly interesting is because it uses algorithms to generate new data. Netflix, if it's using artificial intelligence, is not creating a new program for you to watch. Siri is not creating something new. It's you know giving you a result from your question. Same thing with navigation. It's not going to build a new road for you or say, you know, here's how a perfect highway should be when you're trying to get from point A to point B. And the face scan, it's not, you know, it's not producing a new image. It is simply 
responding to inputs, whereas generative AI, the G for chat GPT generative is producing something new when you watch it write out a paragraph. However, whatever you think about its writing quality, when it produces that, that is for the most part, whole new content, whole new writing. I say for the most part, because if you follow some of the cases that are already developing around these uh, generative products, you'll notice, for example, that the New York Times has uh, sued ChatGPT and Microsoft as well, probably because Microsoft is where the money is at this point for ChatGPT, uh, for the fact that some or whole portions of their articles are appear on some answers in ChatGPT. A few definitions, just so you know that when you see like GPT, what does it mean? It means generative pre-trained transformer. So GPT, a product that would have one of these generative pre-trained transformers, it's supposed to think like the human brain. It's gonna take, it's trained on inputs, just as like we went to school. Um, in the case of a one of these GPTs, it's gonna be trained on a large data set. For chat GPT specifically, it's been trained, if you're using the free version that we'll be showing you, it was trained on knowledge on the internet, a subset of it, of course, up through 2021. And then if you pay them money, I think it's $20 a month, it gets you access to not chat GPT 3.5, but chat GPT 4. One of, one of the big differences there is that its data set is nearer to the present. For the questions, for the most part, that we'll be asking of one of these AIs, it doesn't really matter whether its training stopped in 2021 or its training stopped in you know, December of 2023. Uh, so if we were ask it, you know, draft a model, uh, you know, out of office email for a law firm attorney, it doesn't matter when it was trained in 21 or 23. But if you went to it and you said, what's the best smartphone to buy, it'll produce an answer, but its answer is limited in the free version up to 2021. So it's going to give you quite probably a product that you can't purchase anymore unless you got it used or on some secondary market. Generative AI learns from these patterns and structures to generate this new data. And so it's the generative part of AI that is really exciting and really new in what we're going to show here. In some ways though, of course, as I've mentioned, what's, what sounds really impressive is some, in some respects, what computers have done all along. We give it an input. If, you, you know, if you're as old as I am, you remember playing Oregon Trail. Um, I think we had Tandy computers from Radio Shack, uh, two brands that don't really exist anymore. Uh, so it's simply, you know, the computer had data on it. You would give it a prompt, you would give it a direction, tell it what to do. It will respond to that prompt and give you some sort of output. The interesting thing today, of course, is that that output can be literal, you know, correct sentences, grammar, things like that. So the big deal here is that we have a bunch of new data available and that it can go through at incredible speeds and make sense of that data and give you some useful results from it. So uh, for those of you in some sort of adversarial practice, particularly if you're thinking about discovery, I think this is something that will be quite interesting for AI down the line because you get all of this data in, you wanna be able to ask questions of it. In that sense, it might be something like, uh, like Cliff's Notes um, because you can get the facts out, you can get some of the core ideas out and you, you know, in some of these products, it'll footnote what data source produced a particular sentence or a particular bullet point. And then you can go and look at that data source and say, hey, well, this was a particular deposition or a particular email or a particular memo. And there could be a lot of time savings involved there for something that can very rapidly analyze and produce, you know, a set of data that you can ask questions about. You could say, give me all of the dollar amounts that are cited, or uh, tell me what pages reference Smith v. Jones or something like that. Very interesting in that respect for the analysis of uh, large sets of data. So even though it's what computers have always done, it's bigger data and faster response time that make it really interesting for those of us looking at this field now.
couple of limitations and uh, we'll demonstrate these live here, but AIs are really only as good as the data that it can analyze. So ChatGPT is kind of impressive because it was trained on a broad swath of the internet. If you're thinking for legal specific products, a um, couple of interesting ones out there like Pattern Builder Max. So if you're a firm that uses net documents and that's where you store all of your data, Pattern Builder Max is going to, its data set will be your files. And we'll talk about some of the uh, potential issues of ethics here in just a moment with regard to, to AI analyzing all of your files. Um, it's secondly, it's only as good as the prompt. So the kind of responses you get varies based on the question that we know that in real life, this is true with, uh, with generative AIs as well. And of course, then it's also how good is the programming to respond to your prompt. So your prompt could be wonderfully detailed. And if you handed that prompt to, you know, say a paralegal who'd been in the industry for 20 years, they would produce a marvelous result. You hand that same wonderful prompt to an AI that's only been in public use of any sort for a year and a half, it might produce a far poorer result. It doesn't necessarily mean that your prompt was bad. In fact, you've got a pretty good uh, sort of benchmark or baseline there to say that your prompt was actually pretty darn good. Uh, but there's something about the programming that, you know, it's, it's, it's a growing product. It's not up to snuff quite yet. So let's talk about a few examples of AI products. The first one that I'm going to mention, well, I guess the first one I actually mentioned was Pattern Builder Max. So if you're in the NetDocs camp, uh, I, would, I would probably take a look at that, especially since that's where all your data is. The one that's probably going to be most available as a paid product to most people most quickly is uh, Microsoft's Copilot. So there are some, the Copilot name for Microsoft is kind of an umbrella brand. Uh, there are some free parts of Copilot that you can use, but the big benefit comes from those of you who are in the Microsoft 365 camp. So you're paying Microsoft either annually or monthly for uh, you know, Word, PowerPoint, Outlook, um, you know, Excel, those sorts of programs. If you're on one of those plans, they now have a, an AI tool that can do some of the things that you see here. And I'll show this live in just a minute. Uh, but for example, it could um, search through a Word document and give you answers based on the document that's analyzed. It could take your Word memo or your Word outline, turn it into PowerPoint slides. So if you're working on a presentation for, if you're an estate planning attorney, you're working on a, you know, going to do a presentation at the community center, you know, write the outline, have it, you know, transferred over to PowerPoint. And then you're going to have to add some pictures and some stuff, but it'll, it'll be a good start. Uh, creating charts and formulas in Excel. To me, this is really interesting because I'm good enough in Excel to kind of fumble my way around and to, you know, make it work as I need it to and, you know, have the right words to ask Google or such for, for what I need. But it's pretty interesting there because in that sense, it can actually help you write formulas. Email, we've kind of seen this and we can see this in ChatGPT, but having it built straight into Outlook makes it pretty interesting as well. Because if you're, again, if you're in the Microsoft camp, you're already in Outlook much of the time. So before I dive into the demo for Copilot, and we'll do it with some live material, I do want to talk about one of the things that makes Copilot, NetDocuments, PowerBuilder, Max, and other programs that expressly tell you that they're using the, the you're, they're going to use your data and how they're using it. What makes them unique versus ChatGPT that is just out there on the web for anyone to, to use and try. The bigger benefit that you see from these AIs, even now, but I think it will ex really explode in the next few years, is that essentially the more it knows about you, the more it knows about your firm, the more it knows about how you write and the sort of cases that you deal with and, you know, what sort of, you know, policies you have in place internally, the better when you ask it to produce something, whether it's an email text or a document or a summary, something like that, the better it will be able to do because as you see here, the way Microsoft conceives of Copilot is that you've got the traditional apps. So these are the apps we know, I'm not gonna say love, but we know and we use every day. And 
the kickoff point for accessing the generative AI within Copilot is that you're in a Microsoft program that you know, and you, you open a document or you open an email and you ask it a question. That question is then sort of, I'm going to say flavored by Microsoft Graph, which is just their sort of umbrella name for all of the stuff that you're storing in the Microsoft ecosystem. Emails, files, meetings, chat, calendar, contacts, all the stuff that you're storing with Microsoft. Sort of salted, flavored with that, that little bundle of information is then sent over to the large language model. So for simplicity purposes, you could replace where it says large language model, you could replace that with chat GPT. That's so it's going to take your request, your prompt, salt it with information it knows about, fire it over to Microsoft's version of ChatGPT, which again is still confined within the Microsoft ecosystem. So your data is not, you know, your prompt, your question is not free floating and used for research purposes or anything like that. The large language model produces a result. It's again double checked against that graph. So against what it knows about you and, and your preferences and your behavior, and then it sends it back to the app. And so you get that response straight within the app that you're used to using. It's a pretty clean workflow. Um, let me uh, let me do a couple of demos here to show you what that's like. So I'm going to drop out of PowerPoint and let me uh, bring up Microsoft Word here and bring it over to the screen. And so this is the this is Word for Mac, the experience and how it functions exactly the same for uh, for Windows using folks. So let me just uh, You'll notice here that there's a big button on the uh, screen there and I can hit Copilot. And it's gonna go through and it's gonna take a couple minutes to analyze this document. And this is a physician's recruitment agreement. It's just a document that, you know, if you were starting starting up a, a medical practice, maybe uh, you we each sign, it details some of, the, uh, some of the things going on. If you scroll through it, you'll see that we've got qualifications, recruitment benefits, line of credit, things like that. If I hit, say summarize this document, Copilot's gonna go through, it's gonna look at the document. It's essentially, I'm gonna put it in quotes again, it's gonna read the document and it's gonna give me a few bullet points as a response. You'll notice if you've watched any YouTube videos or any demo videos that Microsoft has put together on these Copilot products that the responses they get are a lot faster. So it's still working, but it gave me the main ideas of what it is. So it's an agreement between the hospital and a physician. It gave me some of the uh, dollar amounts involved, the benefits and repayment options, and it's still working. So it's probably going to give me at least another couple of paragraphs about what's going on in the document. And one of the interesting things that you'll see um, when it comes up here is that sometimes, but not always, it's going to footnote its uh, findings. So down here at the bottom where you have relationship and indemnification of the parties, I can hover over say 0.9 here and it gives me a little preview of it's essentially trying to show its work, like where in the whole of this document that is 13 pages, where did you find this idea? And so if I then click on that, it's gonna take me to that area and it's gonna highlight it. So if you missed it, it highlighted essentially this paragraph of section eight in blue temporarily. So it tells me where it found that data, how it reached that conclusion in, uh, in respect of that summary paragraph. I could ask it some more basic questions like uh, what dollar amounts are involved. And so it's gonna look through and it'll, it should tell me, I think there are a bunch of them in, there's like a credit section in here and there's a bunch of them involved in that um, but as you can see it's churning through it does again little bit of a of a time delay but um it would especially if you had a 60 page document it would almost certainly be faster than trying to skim through it yourself uh, so it, it gave me the first little sentence that tells me they're all between the hospital and the physician this isn't surprising but we do then have uh, our sites for dollar amounts so 1.5 million, we've got a footnote for that. If I click on that, it takes me uh, to section, I'm gonna say 3.1, yep. And then uh, it can draw down 10 grand. That's in section 4.1. So it does a pretty good job uh, with basic questions. The one thing I would really like it to do in Word is to format things and it can't do that, at least not yet. 
So it would be nice, especially for those who don't spend a lot of time in Word or don't like dealing with Word styles, if you could say, make all the sections bold and underlined, and just type that in. I'll do it here just to show you, but um, as of uh, last week when I tried it, let's see, it is not capable of doing that. But one of the nice things about it essentially being built into section titles, underlined. One of the nice things about it being built into Word is like a lot of our web-based products, um, they might make updates and then you'll have these features and they you might not know about it until you actually just try it. So again, not uh, unexpected that it says it can't uh, do that. It didn't say that it can't do it, Dave, which is nice uh, because we don't need any space odyssey uh, um, AIs quite yet. And so let's try a couple of things in Excel. And Excel is a little bit different. Again, we do have that giant copilot button. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit that. And uh, one of the things that is unique about Excel that we didn't see in Word is that in order to work with Copilot in Excel, we've got to have our document auto save. And what that means is that it has to be stored on a Microsoft either SharePoint site or in Microsoft OneDrive. So if I go ahead and I say, turn on auto save, it's going to pop up here with OneDrive and say, yeah, we'll just save it there. And I hit uh, upload. And so it's taking the document that up until now had lived on my desktop and placing it in a Microsoft uh, OneDrive folder. I'll go ahead and replace it because the thing that was there before was just my test. You'll also notice here that Copilot is in preview. So it says preview after it did not say that in the Word section. Um, and if I, you'll notice it also says that the data has to be in a table. If you're comfortable with Excel, maybe a lot of your data is in a table. And a lot of people though think of Excel itself as a table because you know, grid lines, but a table in Excel has a specific sort of function and you can run different uh, queries, different questions against it. But if I click in the area where I need this table, it actually gives me a button here that says, if you don't know how to build a table, I'll do it for you. So I'll hit convert and you'll see it converted it into a table. We've now got, um, we get the benefit of like automatic uh, striped uh, lines. We could do different equations and stuff like that. We can make a lot of other changes, but let's say that we've got this table. Now let's ask it a question. Let's, so we've got, you'll see, we've got the description of the property. We've got uh, different product types, tangible or intangible or real estate, and then we've got a dollar amount. So let's just ask Excel, uh, let's do what, move my mouse out of the way, what is the value of the intangible property? Put that question in, it's gonna think for a bit. And what it's gonna do is it'll essentially go through, and you could write a formula to do this. It wouldn't be, even be terribly difficult. But you, it's going to go through, it's going to find out which of our line items are tangible property and, or I'm sorry, intangible property. And then it's going to, if it's an intangible piece of property, it's going to add that dollar amount and it's going to give us a full total for the intangible property. And you see there, you have to take my word for it, but uh, you're welcome to double check it if you like, uh, but it comes out to uh, 114,430. And then if I go in here, let's say, and I change this real estate to, uh, let's make this uh, intangible. And then we can ask the same question again. We should get a much higher number. Oops, I got a typo. Let's see if it's able to figure out what I meant there when I said with the with two T's. So again, you notice this is all going out within the confines of a safe and secure. Ah, interesting. Do, do, do. Let's see. Let me try that again. Uh, let's go up here. I'm just going to steal the question. wonder if it was because I was clicked outside of the table. See what it does. It's not perfect, as you can see, but and we are doing this live. Um, 
so it's I think it's I think it's counting the uh, this line item as intangible or is intangible even before I had marked it that because I'm not sure the number's right. Can it write a can it write a complaint to breach of the agreement you just showed us? Ah, okay. Let's uh let me flip back to Word here. And so we've got this complaint or this document. Let me go ahead and I'll do a new document here. You'll notice um, that when you when you start paying for Copilot, it does come up. Uh, yes, uh, if you have Microsoft 360, how do you add the Copilot feature? So let me address that really quickly, and then we'll do the do the complaint thing here. So Copilot is an add-on product per user for Microsoft 365. You can be on just about any level of account and add it, but it is it's not inexpensive. So if you are currently paying somewhere in the 12 to $50 per user per month, depending on what level of Microsoft 365 you're on, Copilot is an extra $30 per person per month. So not a cheap thing. You don't have to get it for everyone. So if some of you are on a practice management program where every user has to be on the same level, and that's fairly common on that software, with Copilot, you can have you know, 30 users and you only want to give Copilot to two people and that's absolutely fine. Microsoft is happy to do that. Um, but it, you're talking about $30 per person per month who has access to it. So uh, let's do, write a, well, let's do a complaint for breach of contract. You, oops, let me go back and fix a typo. Contract using and let's see if i've got a reference file here let's see if we can see that um let's see if i can see if i can find physicians document as the agreement breached let's see what it does so we're doing this live i have never tested this so whatever we get we will learn uh together And it might might take a little bit of time too. Uh, it's writing a complaint letter, um, so it's not going to give us a um, like a legal brief formatted as appropriate. But uh, it does give us some ideas. And again, it, you would you know gives you at least a little bit of structure. So particularly if you're not someone who practices in this area, you could use the letter as a model for sending your. Um, your uh, letter to opposing counsel, but it did not do it as a full uh, full brief. It is making cites to the document though, so 6.2 and so forth. Um, and then it made up a doctor's name and, and it also made up a phone number. So uh, keep that in mind too. If, uh, if you remember a case out of New York uh, last year sometime where submitted to the, uh, the uh, court was a brief that had fake case names but real federal judges, and of course that uh, that attorney got in hot water. So here we have a fake phone number and a fake email address. So you would want to, of course, go through and verify it before you uh, you said, "Hey, this is great. Let's just send it off." Uh, so let me bot back into the slides here. So we talked a little bit about Pattern Builder Max. Pattern Builder Max would do the same sort of thing you just saw in uh, Word where we referenced another document in our system and said, use that as the agreement breached. Or you could say, use a particular document as a model for how you want uh, something else to look. Uh, Open AI is really the big story, the one that's you know from November, December of 22, up through much of uh, last year about what they really have done that was quite new. And the sort of genesis of all of that was their 2018 report on what a generative pre-trained transformer looks like, you know, that it's able to essentially, it's using probability to figure out what the next word is when it's writing, quote unquote. Um, so it's using its ability to analyze things and come out and say, you know, the most likely next word is, you know, breach. And then when we, when it looks at all the models and the data that you gave it, it says, yeah, it's probably of, and then probably agreement and so forth. 
Uh, so you're seeing a lot of, um, of that really driving how it's producing text that it gives you. Large data sets learns patterns and structures, and then it produces output. So the big thing, a couple of things on the legal side, one is that we need to think about, obviously there's some case level stuff that would be fairly interesting to do. Like I said, discovery is really kind of the interesting thing for me when we're talking about analyzing a lot of data, but there's some drafting that could help, that it could help with, especially if you've got a great model and you say, you know, take the complaint for Mary Smith, and replace you know the plaintiff with John Doe and replace the you know dates with these dates and it would go through and produce it pretty quickly. Um, but we also have to think about what these AIs, whichever one you're using, are doing with your data and how that affects our obligations as attorneys, as legal professionals, to be good shepherds of the information that our clients give us. So let's do a few, just a few. I promise. Uh, ethical rules to, that we want to keep in mind when we're thinking about um, using uh, one of these AIs. Question in the chat on confidentiality implications for uh, uh, Copilot specifically. So Copilot is one of the few that has, or, or Microsoft, I guess would be the better way to say this. Microsoft uh, makes commitments on Copilot for paying customers. So if you're, if you're not, we're not talking about the free things that you could just like fire up on the web and use, then there are some Copilot tools that, that are free on the web. But if you're paying for it, then there are commitments as far as it's not retaining your data. It's not saving the prompts that you enter for, you know, education or, you know, later use in building a better product. Um, when you're talking about, so those commitments exist for paying customers of Copilot. They exist for many, I can't say all, but many of the legal specific or legal market targeted AIs, such as, like I said, Pattern Builder Max is one, um, LawDroid, there are several of them out there. Um, but that's the big distinction between those products and generally available you know, ChatGPT 3.5, or even if you're paying ChatGPT for ChatGPT 4, they are pretty clear that they keep um, they keep the information that you provide in the prompt for later use on training and improving the product. Um, put have I seen attorneys put on put notice of use of AI and representation and engagement agreements? I haven't yet, um, but I expect that will come pretty quickly. Uh, one of the you know, there are some, uh, you know, there are about three big things that we see specifically called out in engagement agreements generally with tech savvy or attorneys now. One is uh, like a requirement or a notification or a, I guess it would rather be a client specifically declining to have emails encrypted. Uh, you see this particularly with folks who are representing older uh, clients. Uh, so, you know, attorney being good practice encrypts all emails with clients. Client says, this is super annoying. I don't want this. Attorney says, okay, then you're going to specifically, you know, sign something that says you were advised and you decline it. Um, I haven't seen anything specifically on AI yet, but um, the encryption cloud storage used to be one, but that's kind of fading away because just about everybody's storing stuff in clouds now. Um, and then the... Um, the third one is like sort of data exchange. So if you're using one of a portal service or something, that's often specifically called out in an engagement agreement. But I haven't seen anything on AI specifically. I'm not sure. I mean, I think of AI as mostly first draft kind of stuff. I mean, if you write a really good prompt, what I would, I think the high point would be something like you would get back from a good summer associate which wouldn't be necessarily something you'd immediately turn over and say, hey, client, here's this. Um, so I, I'm not aware of any provisions that, that have come up yet for, uh, for representation. Um, because if you view it as a first draft, then that should remain wholly internal. Um, as, as they get, I, I think the first people to probably have such um, clauses would be litigation um, target or litigation heavy practices, simply because it would be 
very enticing to feed in all the discovery data and be able to ask questions about it. Um, and then you've got you've got a twofold issue there. One is you want to make sure whatever product you're feeding that data into has protections that are um, that are enforced and and something that you can point to as having done some due diligence that you didn't just take highly sensitive information, upload it to ChatGPT4 and say, hey, let me ask you questions about this. Uh, and then on the other side, you want to make sure the client is aware this is one of the ways that we analyze uh, the information we receive from discovery or, or so forth. So let's talk about a couple of uh, rules pretty quickly, and then we'll get back to some of the uh, cool tech here. Uh, obviously, we've got our uh, obligation of competence, and then under comment six, specific attention paid to the benefits and risks of uh, associated with relevant technologies. You're taking care of some of that simply by being here today, and I appreciate you uh, being here. Um, let's talk a little bit about communication. Some of the um, some of the things that we could draft either through Copilot, ChatGPT, or such like that uh, might help us with explaining matters a little bit better to clients. Um, we got a question here in the in the chat here. Uh, do you think states will change their rules of professional conduct to cover the user of AI by use of AI by attorneys? Or do I think existing rules adequately cover this? Um, so the ones, the two that I think about most when I when I see a question like that are 5.1 and 5.3. Um, let me skip over to those for just a minute here. Do, do, do. So if you're if you are a supervising partner or you're in a um, sort of oversight role for the firm as a whole, you've got obligations for subordinate attorneys that you, depending on your role, either you're putting in place policies for the firm or you're directly overseeing another attorney. And in those cases, you are responsible uh, for making sure that they have the measures in place or that reasonable efforts are made to make sure that those you're directly supervising are engaging in conduct in accord with the rules. You as the supervisor are on the hook if that subordinate attorney either does something that you order uh, you're on the hook, or you uh, ratify that conduct involved, or, and this is, I think, more the uh, the more troublesome one, is if you knew at a time when you could have mitigated the impact of this misuse or this poor behavior or so forth, and you didn't do something, then you're on the hook. Similarly, basically the same requirements for non-lawyer assistance under uh, 5.3, supervisor or policies in place, you got to make sure that they're in accord with the, uh, the rules of professional conduct, similar behavior. Um, so let's talk about some of the, the implications for AI. The attorneys are still responsible for the AI, the AI's work. I mean, you're, you're not going to be able to say, hey, I used, you know, NetDocs or I used Copilot or I used LawDroid or, um, you know, Westlaw's product to draft this and it had a whole bunch of errors, but that's the AI's problem. You know, I think of the AI as if anything, it is a you know subordinate employee of whatever type and you as the supervisor are responsible for it. If an AI tool makes an error, will the firm need to show the reasonable steps that it took to prevent the error? I think this is most critical. If you're going to use an AI, you should have you know documentation for you know if it's support staff putting stuff through, which I would I would think if if once you as the attorney have experimented with, become comfortable with, generally happy with the AI product, whatever it is, you could probably write up some good directions and then defer or delegate most of that work to somebody else, whether it's a, you know, someone at the firm locally, if it's a virtual assistant that you're using, like an actual human virtual assistant, um, there would be ways to, to sort of offload some of that. Once, once you've gone through, you figured out what the mechanism should be, you figured out what the process should be. I think that will be valuable to prove that, you know, you have done what is a reasonable evaluation of this tool and how it should be used and you've documented how it should be used. And to the extent that they have sort of guardrails on, you know, what, what the AI can reach, what the AI can access, what it looks at, those should be documented as well. So I think, 
I think most of the rules are generally sufficiently sufficiently broad as to the spirit of conduct that you can you could make a good argument that you know there's ultimately still a human responsible and that human has oversight over the AI and that if you know somebody in a somebody in the support role the paralegal role legal assistant role is using the AI that the reasonableness is that you have as the supervising person or entity, you have created rules and procedures to ensure that the use of that technology falls within the um, the general conduct in that case of 5.3. Uh, there are a few more uh, rules that sort of lay out some questions on AI. Let me uh, let me hit a couple of those and then we'll dive in for the last uh, 10 minutes or uh, five or six minutes. I want to save enough time for questions for, we'll do a little bit with uh, chat GPT specifically. So uh, for those of you who are, remember, let me show you, just do a brief refresher on one six, where we've got some requirements on confidentiality, not revealing information related to representations and so forth. Think about, um, especially if you're using one of these generally available publicly, you know, even if you're paying for it, AIs where they're going to save the prompts, think about what you're putting into those prompts and where they might uh, end up later. So what is the security protocol for that AI tool? How does the AI tool use the information it feeds you? The ones that are actually trying to sell to lawyers and to law firms ought to be happily explicit on the idea that they don't save the prompts. If they you know, allow you to upload files for analysis, they've got a very clear policy in place on, you know, if you upload it, you know, it's used for however long, and then you have the option of deleting it, and that actually permanently deletes it. It's not something that we save even for training purposes, which brings us to point three, does the AI train on the information you provide it? And the reason I think this, and you know, some of you probably have some great examples that the hypothetical or the, the experience that I have on this is not AI specific, but there was a case uh, in the Wall Street Journal, they wrote it up, I think, uh, a couple months ago about a hit and run accident in um, Arkansas and twin sisters. One sister was driving, she hit a car, killed somebody, drove away, left the scene of the accident. Hour or so later, woman who looks like the driver of the car came back to the scene, said, I'm sorry, I left, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then went through whatever the legal process was. They, and throughout the investigation, they found out that these were twin sisters and the person, the sister would actually cause the accident who had a, like a rap sheet full of stuff and was I don't know, drunk or high or whatever. And then there's the others, the twin sister, who's got like basically a normal life that the, the, the twin sister had covered for the one who had actually committed the accident. And one of the ways that they found out about this is that the sister who had caused the accident on her cell phone typed into Google, what do I do if I hit a car while I'm high and I kill someone? Of course, Google saved that. Google saves just about everything you type into it. Um, so think about, you know, look at the terms of service, look at what they're telling you. Again, anything that's looking for attorneys, law firms as customers ought to be straightforward. And here's what we do. Here's what we save. Here's how it's saved. Here's how you can delete it. And then we've already touched a little bit on lawyers notifying clients uh, that it is using AI. I don't think it hurts. Um, the, the, only, the only question that I would have is that there are a lot of things that you could disclose in an engagement agreement that you could make a very long engagement agreement if you wanted to make sure that they all, they knew about all the other things going on or all the things, all the people who could possibly touch your file or anything like that. So on some level, yeah, put it in the agreement, you, you, but you don't want your engagement agreement to end up like a terms of service for some software product because yes, you click through, but did you really read it? And eh, no. Um, so keep that in mind too. I think probably the best thing to do would be to um, maybe you have a little, maybe a little technology or a little, um, you know, web services section. And you say, you know, things like, well, we store uh, your data in whatever practice management program and 
we have, uh, you know, we use cloud storage for the data for your documents, and we encourage you to use this secure client portal. And for some of the initial drafting, we may use uh, software products that aid in drafting. Some of these products may include artificial intelligence components, that sort of thing. 7.7, 7, or I'm sorry, 1.7 and 1.9, these deal with uh, conflicts of interest, current and former clients. A couple of things to think about in respect to those roles. If you give these AIs or one of these AI products access to your data, is it possible that having access to the data is using some of the client's information from former clients against a current client and might there be might there have been a conflict or might there be a conflict depending on what it's accessing my general view on this is not not really i mean it depends on i'm sure you can come up with a really great example but i think of this more as you know if you're going to draft a new letter or a new complaint or something like that you're going to go in and find the one that's most like that that you previously did and make edits that's essentially what the AI is going to do also. Um, question of taking your trained technology to a new firm. We haven't really reached that yet because if you leave firm A and they have copilot and you go to firm B, you might take some documents with you. It depends on you know, what your structure of exit from the firm is, but there's not as yet that I know of a way to take you know, whatever knowledge or sophistication that you, you know, your documents have produced in copilot A and then you go set up your own firm and then all that learning or experience is transferred over. We just don't have that yet. Uh, let's do a couple of things in, uh, in ChatGPT here live. So I wanna give you a couple of samples. And again, this is just ChatGPT. So you can, you can go out there right now, like as soon as we finish up here and do what I'm just gonna show you. So let me, uh, let me make this big. And so I've got a few prompts here. So we were talking about some stuff that you might be able to do internally. So let's say that you are maybe fresh out of law school, you're gonna pass the bar, coming up here in, a, in you know, get your certificate in, or well, take the bar in July and get your certificate in October, you're gonna hang out your own shingle. And as you know, you don't often uh, get the experience of saying, hey, I know exactly how to practice law just because I went to law school. So maybe you need some help in figuring out what a script might be when a client reaches out to your brand new firm. So, and you can see ChatGPT is obviously quite a bit faster than Copilot, but it's not, it's not analyzing my particular document. It's, you know, it's been trained on some of these questions. It's probably seen many of these questions before. So we asked it, you know, a script for when your uh, new client first reaches out to you. So it literally wrote something like a script. You have a receptionist part, you have a client part, and then you go, the client and the receptionist go back and forth. And you've got some, uh, some interesting guide, you know, guidelines there. So maybe if you're creating a script for a virtual assistant, that was a pretty quick uh, sort of rough draft that you could use. Let's say that you have a, uh, you want to send this new client a welcome letter and you want some assistance in sort of writing that letter. So we've got a prompt here that is, you know, create a new client letter, help me write that letter. What sort of questions should a new client have and how would I want to include those in my letter? So um, we're thinking as a potential client, what legal services are available? Some of these won't be super applicable because by the time the client has, you're writing a welcome letter to the client, the client probably already knows what legal services you provide. And I, I honestly think this letter is probably a bit long for an initial letter, uh, but again, we're talking about rough drafts here. So they might have questions about who will be handling the case. So they met with you, but maybe you've got some associates or they talked to you initially, but your partner's a lot better at something or other. What are the steps in the process? Uh, what document uh, or information does the client need to provide? How will you handle communications? We, you know, maybe you have that text section where we say, we send encrypted emails and we've got a client portal. We have that in the engagement agreement, but the client doesn't know that necessarily yet. Office hours, contact information, you know, some basic questions. And then um, they drafted, they being ChatGPT, drafted a letter based on what questions 
it thinks the client might have. And so the letter goes through and answers those questions. Maybe, you know, you don't do um, some sort of financial work very often. And so you're not exactly sure what statements or what information you need to get to a, from a client to understand, say, their net worth for a particular matter. Let's go ahead and we'll ask ChatGPT this prompt. All these prompts are in the materials. And like I said, we're just using the free version of ChatGPT. So feel free to experiment uh, with them. Let's say we ask this question and it's going to say, well, here's a list of questions to ask the client about, you know, to learn about their net worth and what they might have. And then what documents might you request to learn more about the client's net worth? Well, it gave you, uh, you know, 10 categories of documents. So especially for areas where you don't practice super often or you're just starting up, might be really good to get, you know, a little baseline. Um, there are, we won't get to them, but in the materials, there are some marketing questions. So if you're one of those attorneys who, like me, not super great on like being judicious and marketing and having strategies and plans and checklists, there are some good prompts in there to help you uh, figure out some of that. But let's say um, you want to tell the client you're going to do, you need to do some discovery work on the matter and you want to explain to the client just what discovery is. And you say, okay. But tell me what discovery is, and it gets a few paragraphs out of the chat GPT system. And you're thinking, okay, this is kind of long. I don't know that the client's going to read all of these. And maybe it uses a few too many legal terms, or it's not super clear. So one of the nice things, and you can do this with Copilot too, you can do this with a lot of the AIs. Tell chat GPT here, explain the discovery process to me as if I were 10 years old. And in ten, for the 10 year old thing, it's doing, um, you know, something like a spaceship and or hide and go seek was something else it gave me earlier when I was testing these prompts. So um, here it's doing, it's doing a detective one. Uh, like I said, the other one, which I thought was a little bit better. And I asked it literally the same question in the same order, got a different response. Was it talked about hide and go seek, which I thought was kind of a good example as well. So we've got about five minutes left, and I did want to save time for uh, questions. I've had the uh, had the chat window up, so I've hopefully been hitting those as we uh, as we've gone along. But if you have some uh, some additional questions, feel free to to throw them out now, uh, and be happy to happy to talk about them. Let's see. pop back up to the slides here, and two 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 two. Yeah, so if you if you go back further in the materials again, you've got all the materials. There are some good uh, prompts for doing marketing. Uh, a few client service examples uh, we've got up there that I put up now. Checklist for opening a file. So particularly great at getting training resources together. Um, favorite uh, chatbot to to to. to uh, so favorite AI chatbot. I I. Well, so I think ChatGPT for like general questions. So if you want to do like marketing, if you want to do things that aren't like document specific to the things you're working on, I think ChatGPT is pretty good. Um, I think it's the, it's obviously, as you saw, it is the by far the fastest of the two. Uh, I haven't had a ton of experience with Claude right now. Um, Copilot, I think has a lot of promise, mostly because... A lot of people are, are on Microsoft 365. They're storing their data there. So I think it's going to be most useful. Um, question on, on the complaint that we did a little bit of early in the session. You could, yeah. So if you pointed it to a model complaint, it, it should be able to follow that model. I've done it with um, something not, not as complex as a complaint, but uh, like asset seizure or something like that. Something that's fairly straightforward and you say, you know, use using document X as a model, um, write a new, you know, document where the plaintiff is Joe Smith, the defendant is, you know, Barry Jones, and the amount in question is, you know, $57,000 and so forth. Um, can you use your, uh, can you AI use data in, you can AI use your data to fill in blanks in your pre-existing forms? Ah, merge fields from existing fields. Um, 
not, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, it's going to, it's going to like, again, I'm going to use, use either it's either chat GPT or copilot. What it's going to do is it'll go through the document. It's not going to tab through like you would, if you had fields, but if you, if you had placeholders and the placeholders, like, so you had a, you know, bracket plaintiff or bracket dollar amount, you could absolutely, you know, write a prompt that said, you know, I'm doing a complaint for, um, you know, complaint for divorce, you know, replace the, you know, spouse one with, you know, Joe Smith and replace spouse two with Mary Smith and replace spouse or replace kids with, you know, Timmy and Jill and Johnny and so forth. That would be essentially up to you as, as the prompt writer. You're not, it's not going to be smart enough now, like where you've got, if you build an actual form in Word, say, and you could say, you know, you could tab, like essentially tab through. It's not going to do that yet, but I expect it, it will. Uh, just like I expect at some point in the not too distant future, it should do word formatting as well. Cause I think that would be one of the more valuable things that word can do uh, with Copilot. So with that second last slide in the materials has a bunch of uh, great podcasts that lawyerist has done on AI. So if you've got more questions and who doesn't on this wonderful field, uh, feel free to take a look at those. Obviously there's the uh, video from last week, if you missed that session. Uh, so take a look at that and I'll turn it back over to Paul. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks for a great uh, presentation that uh, provides some wonderful uh, information for us. And in answer to uh, Philip's question, yes, the DBA will be hosting more AI education. Uh, take a look at our, um, our calendar of events. We are working on them as we speak to get them uh, scheduled and up and available for you. So again, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Thanks for all the people who attended. Uh, this was a great turnout uh, with some great information and we hope to uh, see you soon at the next VBA uh, program about artificial intelligence. Thanks and have a great afternoon.